on episode 403 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet David Winston and discuss his book, Adaptogens. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 403. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Our guest today has been working with medicinal herbs since 1969. Uh, real deep, deep, deep <laughs> into this subject. He knows it better than anybody. And today we're going to talk about his book, Adaptogens. With no further ado, here's David Winston. David, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, more and more, uh, in the, I guess the, like the last uh, 10 years, it just seems like it's uh, it's kind of a building thing, which I think is really good. Uh, there's more discussion about some of the the natural healing properties of plants and herbs. Uh, you know, kind of looking back at some of the Eastern medicine, you know, Chinese medicine, uh, you know, uh, Ayurveda from the, from India, uh, and actually adopting some of those now as treatments and and protocols, uh, whereas not going with the chemicals. So your book Adaptogens really kind of gets into the history of this and into what they are and how we can use them. Uh, I just, like I said, it's fascinating to me how much is out there and we're just still just kind of scratching the surface. Well, that's true. You know, it's interesting. This year is the 50th year since I started studying herbal medicine. And I joke a bit, but I'm not entirely joking when I tell people after 50 years, I now consider myself to be an advanced beginner. There is endless amount to learn, whether we are talking about traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, the uh, Middle Eastern Yunani Tib, Campo from Japan, et cetera, Tibetan medicine, uh, American eclectic medicine, physiomedicalism, all these traditions are rich in the use of plants for medicine. So this tr these traditions, in some cases, go back at least 3,000 years Plus, you then combine that with the vast amount of plant, uh, medicinal plant research that is occurring throughout the world. Very little, unfortunately, in the United States, but extensive amounts in China, India, Iran, Japan, South Korea, um, Sweden, uh, France, Germany. So all around the world, there is a tremendous amount of plant research. And in many cases, this plant research, this modern plant research is confirming, uh, although sometimes going well beyond the understanding that people have had for thousands of years of how these substances can help us to live healthier, better lives. And one of the things that's really important to understand a lot of people have this idea that it's sort of an either or situation. It's either orthodox Western medicine or it's complementary alternative medicine, herbal medicine, natural medicine. And honestly, nothing could be further than the truth. Where orthodox medicine is strong tends to be where things like herbal medicine aren't that effective and vice versa, where herbal medicine is really strong, tends to be in areas, especially dealing with things like chronic degenerative disease, where orthodox medicine often has little to offer. So when it comes to the individual, the patient, the client, the real win-win is understanding which is appropriate in a given situation. Herbs are not the answer to everything. Adaptogens are not the answer to everything. But then nor does orthodox medicine have the answer to everything. So understanding which therapy, which treatments are most effective, most appropriate for a given situation, for a given person is essential. Now, an adaptogen is, is not just a chemical compound they're pulling out of a plant to, to make a new medicine with. It's it's actually using the whole plant, right? Can you can you talk about adaptogens, what they are and, and what they do? Absolutely. And this is going to get slightly complex, um, but I will do my absolute best to keep it as simple as possible. So 
initially, you know, in all these ancient systems of medicine, there are tonic herbs. So in Ayurveda, they're called Rasayanas uh, or Rasayanas. Uh, in uh, TCM, in traditional Chinese medicine, they're known as qi tonics or kidney yang tonics or blood tonics. But these traditional definitions of a tonic remedy do not necessarily equate to what we today call an adaptogen. An adaptogen is a modern scientific concept developed initially in the Soviet Union. The initial research was done by a professor, Lazarov, starting in the late 1940s. Uh, and if, if you think, wow, they must have been very you know, forward thinking to do this kind of research, the reality was this was initially military research and the Russians were, the Soviets were trying to do what Khrushchev said, and that was bury the West. They were trying to find ways to make better soldiers, better cosmonauts, better workers so that they could outdo us and literally win uh, the Cold War. But basically what happens is the research eventually goes from, they initially started looking at chemical substances and with um, a Dr. Breckman, who is considered the father of adaptogenic research, he switches over to looking at plants. And they eventually settle on a plant called, at the time in the United States, uh, we learned about it known as uh, Siberian ginseng, but the proper name for it is Eleuthero, Eleutherococcus centicosis. And that's where the initial research starts. And what they did is they first promoted a definition of an adaptogen using a very simplistic three parameters. Number one, the plant was non-toxic in a normal therapeutic dose. All right, so that's that's fine. The problem with that is that that describes almost every herb in the Materia Medica. I mean, yes, there are some toxic herbs, but most herbs are relatively benign in a normal therapeutic dose. Secondly, they decided that these herbs would create what was called a nonspecific state of resistance to stress. So that means they help you to resist stress, whether that stress is psychological, physiological, or environmental. But the problem there is, is that other categories of herbs, including nervines, which we think of as nerve tonics, uh, things that are calming, also help you to deal with stress more effectively. So that doesn't really mean that it is absolutely an adaptogen. And thirdly, that they would have what is called an amphoteric effect on the body, helping to normalize function of multiple systems, especially the uh, endocrine system, nervous system, immune system, as well as the cardiovascular and digestive systems. So that was the initial definition. And that last started, I think that was that definition came out around 1969. So after that, in the intervening, we're now 50 years later, the definition has changed. Now, the, those first three parameters are all still true, but they have added to the definition. So in the 1990s, they determined that adaptogens work primarily through two master control systems in the body. One is called the HPA axis. That's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. This is the master control system of almost all endocrine function, much nervous system function, immune function. And it also is what deals with chronic stress in our lives. And then the second system is called the SAS, the sympathoadrenal system. And this is your fight or flight mechanism, which deals with acute stress. So in order for an adaptogen to be an adaptogen, there has to be evidence that it is primarily working through the one or both of these two master control systems. Further research showed us that adaptogens also work on a cellular level. So what does this mean? It means that they do several things. Number one, they help reduce um, uh, stress hormone production. So that's especially cortisol, norepinephrine, and they help prevent cortisol-induced mitochondrial dysfunction. So for instance, uh, some of the conditions associated with stress-induced mitochondrial dysfunction include things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue immune deficiency syndrome, which is one of the reasons adaptogens can be so useful as part of a protocol for treating those conditions, because underlying those conditions is basically elevated levels of stress hormones, specifically cortisol, which shuts down the mitochondria 
which are the engines of your cells. So if your mitochondria are not working, you are going to have all sorts of problems with fatigue, with muscle weakness, with muscle pain, uh, with cardiovascular issues, and et cetera, et cetera. And they do this, um, not only do they shut down the um, excessive production of cortisol, but they do it by upregulating certain stress um, modulators in the body. These are known as heat shock proteins, uh, forkhead proteins, and something known as neuropeptide Y. So in order for an herb to be an adaptogen, it has to do every single one of these things. So, of course, the ancients had no idea about any of these things. So when they're talking about a rasayana or a chi tonic, you know, those things, some of them actually turn out to be adaptogens. But of course, many of them do not because they don't meet the parameters of today what we know is an adaptogen. Okay, so kind of my key takeaways from this is that, that one, adaptogens uh, don't just address one part of the body. Like I think in the book, you talked about how turmeric actually supports the liver in a single organ versus actually supporting the whole body through the, you know, uh, HPA and through the SAS, right? Uh, And then the other piece of it is it it doesn't just push us in one direction. It's sort of a, a, a balancing, getting us more towards homostasis than pushing us in one direction just because we're stressed, trying to push us unstressed. Uh, It's literally just kind of trying to find that balance. Correct. Now, I will say that turmeric, by the way, of course, is not an adaptogen. Turmeric just doesn't work on the liver. Uh, Turmeric has much broader implications. In fact, the vast majority of herbs have a wider sphere than just working on a single organ. But adaptogens, you could, yes, I think your, your definition, think of them as almost systemic remedies, but their primary effects are on endocrine, nervous system, and immune function. That is where, because that's, of course, what the HPA axis and the SAS, those are the things that they are affecting. Now, of course, the reality is, is that the SAS also and the, and the HPA axis also affect skin function. They also affect circulation. They also affect reproductive function, both male and female. Um, so again, very wide ranging effects. And at the same time, you mentioned homeostasis, adaptogens work in a really interesting way. So think of it this way. We, we, anybody who has had anatomy and physiology learned about homeostasis, where the body tries to maintain its normal balance. So some things are maintained in very, very tight, like your, so your serum sodium levels, your blood ser- serum levels of sodium have to be maintained within a very, very narrow range. And so the body will work exceedingly hard uh, to make sure that it stays there. And the idea of homeostasis is everything tries to stay the same. Well, in reality, there is a second process known as allostasis that the body uses to maintain homeostasis. And adaptogens also enhance allostasis. No, so what is allostasis? So any of your listeners who have ever gone surfing, and you don't even have to be a surfer, you could go skiing, you could go ice skating, uh, skateboarding, anything where you need really good balance. So if you got up on a surfboard and you stand absolutely still as those waves are moving you in every direction, you're going to stay on that board for about a second. In order to stay on the board, you start moving and shifting your body weight to compensate for changes. That is allostasis. Allostasis is the body's ability to change in order to maintain balance. And adaptogens help in that process. Okay. So most of the book, we're talking about stress. So we're talking about, you know, our body is going through, it can go through acute stress, which just basically means, you know, I see a bear and, oh, I got to run versus chronic stress where my CFO is the bear and he's on me every day. And so that stress just sticks with me. And my fight or flight is basically every waking moment. Adaptogens can kind of help us with that, right? So can you kind of talk through the stress reaction process and then how adaptogens can come back and kind of support us as we as we deal with chronic stress, particularly? Well, 
they're working on multiple levels and that that's where it gets a bit complicated because um, just to give you an example. So for instance, I mentioned earlier that among the sort of molecular chaperones or stress chaperones that adaptogens affect, uh, we have what are called heat shock proteins. These are molecular chaperones. And so these molecular chaperones, heat shock proteins, protect uh, basically mitochondria from stress-induced damage. Then they also regulate a, a chemical called FOXO. It's a forkhead protein. And basically, FOXO basically is a neuro, uh, is a, um, excuse me, FOXO is upregulated and it promotes synthesis of proteins which inhibit the effects of stress. It helps detoxify cells. It also has been shown to enhance longevity. I also mentioned it basically upregulates a neuropeptide Y, which is a neurotransmitter, which has been shown to relieve anxiety. It's been shown to inhibit pain perception. It lowers blood pressure. It inhibits addiction. Uh, it inhibits cortisol release. So those are just some of the compounds that it is affecting and having a broad ranging effect on the body. So when we are under stress, there is a whole cascade of um, cellular and organ response in the body. And adaptogens are saying to the body, think of adaptogens as sort of like a stress vaccine. Some people call it a stress mimetic. In fact, what adaptogens do is they say to your body, stress is coming. So let's get ready for stress. So in that sense, it's a little bit like going to the gym. So many of your listeners probably work out. Maybe some of them are runners. Um, you did The first time you ran, you didn't run a marathon, at least not if you were smart. The first time you start running a short distance, and then the next day you run again and again, or you go to the gym and you start off with a low amount of weights and a small amount of repetitions, and you gradually work your way up to where your muscles become stronger, where you have more stamina, more strength, and the ability to do more. Adaptogens work very similar to this. They basically say to your body, stress is coming, get ready. And so the body builds up so that it is more prepared to deal with stress when the actual stress comes, whether that is an acute stress or a chronic stress. The one difference between adaptogens and say going to the gym is that if you go to the gym and you don't go to the gym for two weeks, you may lose a little bit of strength and stamina, but you, you still ha ha have a significant uh, sort of long-term effect. Adaptogens have to be taken regularly because the effect doesn't have a long-term effect. So these are things you would take on a regular basis. And of course, which adaptogens an individual takes are going to depend on the specifics of that person, because it's important to note that adaptogens are not a one-size-fits-all phenomenon. A lot of people think, oh, you need an adaptogen, just take any one. Well, that's not true. There are stimulating adaptogens, there are calming adaptogens, there are heating adaptogens, cooling adaptogens, drying adaptogens, moistening adaptogens, nourishing adaptogens. And so the key is, and that's, of course, one of the reasons I wrote my book, is that I wanted people to number, understand what I would call the personality of each of these adaptogenic herbs so that you can figure out which one or ones, because remember, traditionally in all the great systems of herbal medicine, herbs are never taken as simples, meaning one herb at a time. They're taking in complex formulas. Why? Because we are dealing with complex people with complex problems. And so the idea is which adaptogen or adaptogens and the sort of supportive herbs or companion herbs for adaptogens, such as nervines, nootropics, and we'll talk about this more later, or restorative tonics that you take with them to help create something that is actually going to be beneficial and work for the individual. Great herbalists don't treat diseases, we treat people. Yeah. So let's let's go ahead and jump ahead then and let's have that conversation about the nervines and the supporting components and, and, and the nootropics. Uh, let, let's get into those just a little bit so they know what we're talking about. Okay. So 
we d- we've defined what an adaptogen is, and we'll talk more about them. But there are other, and I include this in my book, there are other herbs that I would call companion herbs to adaptogens. They work really well with adaptogens. And so the three categories of these, and the first is nervines or nervines in England. And these are calming herbs. I mentioned that briefly before. And they basically help to restore the emotional foundation. So for people who are especially type A personality, for people people who have, uh, you know, emotionally labile for people who have number 10 reactions to number one problems, nervines can be really useful along with perhaps calming adaptogens for a person like that. Then we have what are known as nootropics. Now I have to define this because nootropics, some people call them smart drugs. There are three different categories. There are the chemical smart drugs, which are often designer drugs created in the laboratory with no history of previous use and no record of safety. Uh, I am very leery about these substances. Then there are the supplement nootropics, and these include things like L-carnitine and things like that, which have a very good safety record. And then there are our herbal nootropics, and there are a wide variety of herbal nootropics. These herbs tend to be neuroprotective. They are anti-inflammatory, neuro anti-inflammatories. They enhance cerebral circulation. They enhance memory, focus, concentration. And there is some evidence that at least some of them may help at least slow, if not possibly help prevent Uh, something like dementia or Alzheimer's, but that is a very, very preliminary. Then we have what I would call restorative tonics, and these are basically herbs that are nutritive, they are help to enhance overall function, but they do not meet the definition of an adaptogen. So now I'll mention a couple specifically. We have herbs like the goji berry, very, very popular herb, the Chinese herb astragalus. Uh, Herbs like this are wonderful, nutritive herbs, but they are not adaptogens, even though a lot of people tend to throw them in that category. Unfortunately, uh, they just don't meet those definitions. Okay. So um, if I came to you as a client, and, and generally, okay, just a general description, um, over, over 40 and high chronic stress, and you were going to kind of put together a general protocol what what are some of the things that would be included in that protocol? Well, unfortunately, that's not enough of a definition, okay. <laughs> a, a description that I could come up with something because I need to know everything about you. You know, as is somebody who is a patient of mine, um, I need to know not only their age and their weight and their blood pressure. I need to know their medical history. I need to know. I need to know everything I can about them. You know, and they would bring in their blood work from their physician and their diagnoses that they have from their doctor, and you put together a protocol that is specific to the patient. Because remember, as I said, great herbalists don't treat diseases. Uh, medical med, Western medicine focuses in on disease. We don't focus in on disease. We focus in on creating protocols to help people be well, to help people prevent disease, to help people, um, you know, to gain maximal health, strength, longevity, etc. So, but what what I would look at is, for instance, if you were somebody who was deficient and depleted, I might include some stimulating adaptogens. And stimulating adaptogens would include things like uh, perhaps uh, Asian ginseng or rhodiola. So, or on the other hand, if you were really depleted, deficient, uh, exhausted all the time, then I want to make sure I include some of the nourishing adaptogens. So there may be something like American ginseng. If you were um, had a excess personality, uh, type A personality, uh, you know you can't shut your mind off. Then we might consider some of your calming adaptogens, such as ashwagandha or schizandra. And so. There are different ones that we would use. And by the way, not every single person gets an adaptogen. I don't want people to think that adaptogens are panaceas. Adaptogens are incredibly useful. Don't get me wrong. I do use them a lot. But I'm using a broad spectrum of herbs. Adaptogens are just one part of that. And I need your listeners to understand, adaptogens are not a replacement for the foundations of health. Foundations of health are adequate, good quality sleep, 
a good diet, exercise, healthy lifestyle choices. So if you were eating fast food, three, you know, three meals a day, only getting six hours sleep, um, running yourself ragged, uh, training for a marathon, working an incredibly stress-filled job, and smoking, I don't care how many adaptogens you take, it is not going to make up for the fact that you are abusing yourself. And in fact, at best, it's going to simply allow you to abuse yourself a little bit longer until you finally collapse. It's kind of the whipping the, uh, you know, the, the, the exhausted horse. You can make it go a little further, but it's going to collapse. So adaptogens are not a replacement for the foundations of health. But for the average American who is overfed, under-exercise, uh, not getting enough sleep, uh, especially when it's a situation where, for instance, you're actually trying to take care of yourself, but maybe there's a new baby in the house and you're not getting enough sleep. Or maybe you just graduated from uh, law school, passed your boards, and you just hired at a new law firm and they're expecting you to work 70-hour weeks. Or maybe you are in college and you're you know, having to pull all-nighters and study, which I highly do not recommend. It reduces <laughs> comprehension dramatically. But you know, adaptogens under those circumstances, or you mentioned the example earlier where your boss is on your case all the time and it's incredibly stressful, and maybe you don't have the option to change. Maybe you're in a situation where you live in a small town where, um, you know, there's only one employer and you don't have a lot of options. Adaptogens can be incredibly useful. Again, helping to prevent stress-induced cortisol elevation, helping to reduce the stress-induced anxiety, helping to reduce the stress-induced elevation of blood pressure, and the resultant, of course, mitochondrial dysfunction that comes with elevated cortisol levels. And I will point out that elevation of cortisol can come from lack of sleep, obesity, or stress. And chronically elevated cortisol levels not only basically shut down the mitochondria in the cells, chronic elevation of cortisol is pro-inflammatory. And of course, all of our chronic degenerative disease is inflammatory in nature. It raises blood pressure. It interferes with sleep. It interferes with digestion. It decreases immune response. Uh, it increases the growth of tissue, including skin tags, benign prostatic hyperplasia in men, fibroids and uterine fibroids in women, uh, cancer. Chronically elevated cortisol is really not good. And so anything we can do to help our body to reset and be at a, you know, a, a healthier baseline on a regular basis is going to long term have profound positive implications for our health. And so I guess the way I kind of take this is, you know, you, you can't just say, okay, I need ashwagandha. I need uh, uh, Chinese ginseng or Asian ginseng root. I need American ginseng root. And, and everybody needs that. The reality is you're going to have to kind of put together a protocol for yourself based on your own personal needs. That's actually true. You know, they're, they're, first of all, as I said, not everybody needs adaptogens, period. But if you do feel you need adaptogens, and again, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, is so that each each herb has its own monograph so you can read about it and say, wow, does this make sense for me? And I often mention, like, I often use it with this or that, so that people can kind of get a sense if they don't have access to a clinical herbalist or a, a you know, a naturopathic physician who's trained in botanical medicine or a medical doctor who knows herbs. Um, if they don't have access to someone like that, they can at least educate themselves so they can decide which of these things may, would be most appropriate for them. And again, not everybody needs them, but I would say that, you know, discounting cultures where there are either people are actively starving, suppressed, or at war, you know, Americans are some of the most stressed out people in the world. Absolutely. <laughs> That's why I moved to Panama. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three mm -hmm. strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Well, three. <laughs> Let's go back to the foundations of health that I just mentioned. In 1910, the average American slept slightly over nine hours per night. 
Now, the average American sleeps less than seven hours per night. In the intervening 100 plus years, we have not evolved to need less sleep. We're just chronically sleep deprived. So number one, make sure that you get minimum seven hours sleep a night. Eight is definitely better. Um, if you're sleeping more than nine hours a night, that suggests some issues. So somewhere between seven and nine hours is, is probably ideal. But the key important thing is when you wake up in the morning, do you feel refreshed? Do you feel rested? Because even if you're getting 12 hours sleep a night and you wake up in the morning and you feel tired, you're exhausted, then you have some type of sleep issue. And so it is absolutely essential you figure out what that is because no matter what you have, if you, if you, um, if you have sleep issues, your chances of having a, a heart attack increase. If you have sleep issues, your chances of dying from cancer increase. If you have sleep issues, your blood pressure is going to increase. If you have sleep issues, your cortisol levels are going to increase. So sleep is foundational. Number two, move and move a lot. Uh, we sit too much. We are not active. And of course, some people are not as capable as you know heavy exercise. I'm not talking about you have to run marathons. Do what you can, whether it is swim, whether it is dance, whether it is practice yoga, move. Number three, and I'm going to go beyond three, eat a healthy diet. And I'm astonished at what people think is a healthy diet. Um, I have my patients fill out a three-day diet diary, and I just sit there, scratch my head sometimes, and you know, because people tell me, yeah, I think I eat pretty well. And so, of course, food is foundational. You know what they say with computers, garbage in, garbage out? Well, diet is the same way, garbage in, garbage out. You are dependent on your food for what Chinese medicine is called the gu qi, the grain qi, the nutrients of that food to feed every cell in your body. And so eat healthy. I am not a big fan of fad diets. I think that um, you need to figure out what works for you. And some people can be very healthy vegetarians, and I've met people who just can't do that diet. So it's not like there's one diet that is good for everybody. You have to figure out what works for you. But what I can tell you very clearly is fast food, uh, for instance, fried foods, uh, a heavy, heavy meat diet, things like that are generally not good for almost anybody. So, and then number four, emotional health. Um, emotional and spiritual health are, in my opinion, again, foundational. Um, having, you know, uh, loved ones, whether it is anything from a companion animal to friends to a life partner uh, to community, uh, social networks, these are incredibly important. And I am a big believer in the power of higher uh, higher uh, this power of a higher power the power of a higher power uh, of, of having some type of spirituality in your life i'm not necessarily talking about a specific religion but having something that you realize that you are a small part of something greater than ourselves so having meaningful ceremony uh having you know and whether you think of it as the power you know the gaia the you know the power of nature whether you think of it as god Allah, you know, that to me is not as important. And of course, for individuals, I'm sure it's very important, their spiritual and religious beliefs, and that's great. Um, but find something that works for you and works within your life. And so for me, those sort of things are absolutely foundational to health. And then we have other things that can add to that. And some of them like Nutritional supplements can be useful, although I am much more interested in using herbs because I think they are more, much more bioavailable and in a form that people can actually utilize more effectively. Those kinds of things, stress reduction techniques, are sort of build based on that foundation. Well, thank you, David. You know, the one thing I'll say about the book is if anything and everything that you want to know about adaptogens, this, this is the book. Um, <laughs> that's called adaptogens. But it literally, you, you cover the history, you cover what they are, how they work, uh, you know, all the different types, because uh, there's, there's lots of them. Yes. <laughs> like you said, there's 250,000 plant species that we've identified, and we're just starting to learn uh, how those can help us. But this book really, I think, 
you could have called it the Encyclopedia of Adaptogens or the Complete Book of Adaptogens. Uh, it really is comprehensive. And so if you're interested in adaptogens, uh, I strongly suggest you check out David's book. So David, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, learn more about the book or, and the things you're doing, where would you like for me to send them? Well, a couple things. Number one, um, if anybody is interested in the book, they can get it, you know, simply from Amazon if they like or their local bookstore. It's widely available. Um, you can also contact me or reach me through two websites. Uh, there is my school. I have a two-year herb studies program for people who want to train to be clinical herbalists, and that is herbalstudies.net. And then I also have a website, which is an educational website where people can download free articles, uh, information, articles from my library, which is one of the largest private herbal research libraries in North America, uh, information on my on classes where I'll be teaching around the world. Uh, I teach all over the U.S., Canada, Europe, occasionally Central America. And that uh, website is herbaltherapeutics.net. And um, those are the two places that people can get additional information or contact me. I also have through, I believe it's the Herbal Therapeutics website. I have a Facebook page where I do posts about every two weeks so people can tune into those posts and read the old posts, everything mostly on the topic of herbal medicine and my travels and things like that. And so hopefully people will avail themselves. The book, as we said, is um, um, Adaptogens, Herbs for Strength, Stamina, and Stress Relief. This is the second edition. Uh, it is just out. And uh, I think anybody interested in the topic will hopefully learn quite a bit and uh, be able to make better choices for themselves in their use of adaptogens, nervines, nootropics, and restorative tonics. All right. You can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 403, and I'll have the links there for uh, the book, for David's sites and all that. So David, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you, Alan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you did, um, you know, right now I'm getting ready to head up to uh, Ohio for the Author Academy Awards. And I really appreciate because there's still time. Uh, if you would go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash finalist and on the health section, uh, you can vote for the Wellness Roadmap. We are a finalist for the Author Academy Awards and the Fan vote is actually a big part of the scoring. So please go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash finalist on page seven of 16, the health category. Uh, you'll see the wellness roadmap there. Click on it. You don't have to leave any information, just the click and you're voting for the book. It really helps me. It helps the book. Uh, it helps a lot of people notice that this is out there. So please, please do go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash finalist and vote for the wellness roadmap today. Thank you. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Moira Berman and discuss some of the differences between training physically in a gym between men and women. Until then, have a happy and healthy week. <laughs>